Shark Dropper Studios presents to you. Doppel Avenue Hurt. Case one. Case one. The Silver Casket. Part 11. A Shopping Surprise. It was getting dark, but I had to talk to Charlotte Greenbaum. Arthur had just left the house with her husband wearing handcuffs. A stolen vase? <laughs> there was more to this case than that. My hunches aren't always right, but when they are, I'm a correct motherfucker. Hello? Oh, the police officer. Come in. How can I assist you, sir? Just wanted to talk to you about your husband. He was just here. Your friend arrested him. He's not my friend. Actually, he's kind of an asshole. Oh, dear. Harsh words. You should be careful. Just because someone acts naughty from time to time doesn't mean they're a... Oh, how do you put it? A-hole? He may just be having a rough day. Remember, everyone's always going through something in their life. Those are odd words for a woman whose husband was just arrested. Who am I to interfere with the police? Just because my partner arrested your husband, Evan Greenbaum, doesn't mean the arrest is justified. Oh, I know. This is America, home of the free. Every man is innocent until proven guilty. Right. So, may I ask you some questions about your husband and the incident that happened next door? Of course. My daughter Polly is in bed now, and I was just washing some dishes. Thank you. Would you care for some tea? Uh, sure. Yeah. What about some L? I'm, I'm sorry? Maybe some G? What the fuck? I'm not sure I'm following. Like the letters! <laughs> what letters? The letters of the alphabet, silly. <laughs> I said, would you like some tea? Tea is a drink, but it's also a letter in the alphabet. So when you said, would you like some tea, I asked if you would like some L or G too. You know, other letters from the alphabet? It's a little joke I made up. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm a real jokester. I hope you can handle it. I'll do my best. Here, follow me to the kitchen. I'll make you some tea. The drink, that is. <laughs> we headed into a large kitchen with a center island that would rival most dining room tables. I pulled out a bar stool and sat. She set a kettle and then went back to her dishes. So what would you like to know? Do you think your husband actually committed a murder? I would be very surprised if he did, but if the police believe- what about theft? Do you think your husband is guilty of stealing one of the O'Reilly's priceless faces? I don't recall owning a vase. Plants scare me. So the fact that we had one in the house that your friend found must mean that my husband stole it. Wait, wait. You're scared of plants? Yes. Why won't they just leave? <laughs> a joke? <laughs> I know, I know. I can't stop. I'm on one of those rolls, and I'm not talking about bread. <laughs> did you see what I did there? Rolls? Clara, Mrs. Greenbaum, this is actually quite important. I'm sorry, go on. If your husband knew you hated plants and didn't want vases in the house, then why would he steal one? Beats me. At that moment, Charlotte reached into the refrigerator and pulled out a bag of beets. She started hitting herself with them. Get it? Beats me? She really went a long way for a pun. See, I said beats me. It's a common expression when someone doesn't know something, but I also have some beats, and I'm hitting myself with them, like when you beat something. Look, the dissection of your puns is very helpful, but Mrs. Greenbaum, I'm running out of time. Would your husband have any reason to steal a vase, and more importantly, do you think your husband is capable of committing the murder of Mr. Jeffrey O'Reilly? Hmm, no.
I snuck around the Greenbottom household and over into the O'Reilly property. I took cover behind a large oak and knelt down. All the windows were open. I used my binoculars to peer into each room. The first room was empty. I moved to the next. Peter appeared. He was making a fort out of sheets and stacks of money. What a childish man. I moved to the next window. The bathroom. Catherine O'Reilly sat on the toilet, grimacing. Gross. Ugh. In the next window, Grandpa O'Reilly was in his wheelchair, staring at a large portrait of Grace Kelly. The next window displayed Natalie, putting her two daughters to bed. She tucked him in, turned off the lights, and walked out. I moved to the next window, where Natalie entered the room. This must be her bedroom, although... She lived in Snyder, Texas, so maybe this was the guest room. Natalie began undressing. On to the next room. I turned to the next room, which showed Butler. He was just standing in the middle of the room, staring at a corner of the ceiling. Rather than go to the next room, I decided to backtrack to Natalie's for just a moment. I may have, uh, you know, missed something. I went back to Natalie's room and saw her in her pointed bra and lace underwear. Oh, man. Maybe I should stop. But I couldn't look away. She was gorgeous. I dropped the binoculars for a second. And that's enough. But then I quickly raised them again and continued staring. She didn't shut the curtains. Instead, she took off her bra. <sighs> okay. I'm not a P.I. anymore. I'm a P.T. A peeping Tom. Suddenly, Natalie stopped undressing and walked to the window. Ah, oh, no. Did she see me? But she did look in my direction, into the darkness. And then she smiled and slowly shut the curtains. Interesting. Many of the lights began to go out in the rooms. O'Reilly bedtime. Only one light remained on. Peter's. I leaned against the oak and peered into the room. He now had millions of dollars stacked up into a pyramid shape and was masturbating furiously. He started screaming money quite loud, although no one stirred. This guy was a nut. It was time to go. I got home at 9.15 precisely. I walked all the way home. I needed time to think, but nothing had changed. Maybe I could look at the files again. Maybe it would spark something. This whole case was confusing and seemed to be solved too easily. Numbskull Arthur couldn't see it, but I did. I went to the bedroom. Jesus! <coughs> I walked into my bedroom to find catnip, Edith's pet cat, in between two running treadmills with its feet tied together. What the hell? Sorry to barge in, Mr. K. I forgot my fucking cat. I, I see that. What happened to just shutting him inside the room? I'm used to the treadmills. How did you even get him in here? I put them on a bunch of roller skates and two by fours. Plus, I know a lot of little guys. I don't know what that means. Come here, kitty. <coughs> Sorry, catnip. I didn't mean to fucking forget you. <coughs> Mr. K, you want me to get these treadmills out of here? Not now. I'm going to bed. Okay, Mr. K. I'll see you tomorrow. When she left, powered down the treadmills and fell onto the bed. I was asleep faster than a crack attic ruins their life. A 
Humphrey Bogart once said that the problem with the world is that everyone is a few drinks behind. I decided to do my best to try to catch up. It was now Friday evening. The last few days were spent going through files and drinking as much scotch as I could. Edith and I were back in the office. Files littered my desk, floor, walls, and chairs. Paul would be by tomorrow to pick them up. Still couldn't shake this feeling that something was amiss. Names, places, incidents kept popping up in my mind. The words swirled around my head like pink cotton candy. O'Reilly, Andrew Gardman, Rare Vase, Adoption, The Green Bombs, Murder, Burglary, Wisps, Peter Falk. Nothing made sense. I poured myself another scotch. Things had changed quite a bit over the last few days. Desmond Grant was now free. The merger was going through tomorrow. Paul was out of the hospital and back to work. Although he had a bit of a limp. Angela had not returned my calls. Hope she didn't split and leave town for good. Terrence had paid me the rest of the money for solving the case. It was quite a large sum. Bought quite a bit of scotch with it. It was the largest amount of money I'd ever received, and yet... I didn't feel like I deserved it. Five o'clock. Time to go home. I arrived home at 5.25. I hoped to get some sleep since the uncertainty of this case had kept me up late for the last few nights. I'm sure a nice glass of scotch would help me catch some Z's. Mr. Keys? What? I turned around to see Natalie O'Reilly, or Brewster, walking towards my door. Miss Brewster, what are you doing here? May we talk? Of course. Come in. Oh, you have a nut. You have a place. I know. It doesn't quite meet the standards for which your family lives. <sighs> no, it's quaint. You have a couch. That's more than some people have, I guess. Can I help you, Miss Brewster? Call me Natalie. I came to thank you for finding my father's killer. I meant to come sooner to thank you, but with the merger coming up, things have been hectic with our family, as you can imagine. Right. I never expected Evan Greenbaum to be capable of such an atrocity. Yeah, well, I don't know. I stopped myself. Maybe I shouldn't speak about my doubts out loud. Sometimes... It's the last person you expect. Yes, but in this case, the last person I expected to be the killer was you and McGregor. Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yes. Okay. That's fucking weird. Is there anything else I can help you with? You know, I saw you that night. Um, night. What night? Mm, uh, not ringing a bell. Don't know what you're talking about. I believe it was a Tuesday. I saw you behind the oak tree watching me undress. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh. Oh, don't be bashful. I would have stopped if I didn't want you to see. Uh, I was doing... I was actually... I was actually doing very important detective work. <laughs> I'm sure you were. I apologize for that. I, I didn't... No need. Natalie walked up to me. She put her face right in front of mine. Did you like what you saw? I saw your boobies. I liked your boobies. That's when she leaned in and kissed me. Oh, wait, wait. What's, what's, what's happening here? Mr. Keys, I liked you the moment you sashayed into our mansion. I don't sashay. I mean, there's a one time by accident, but I don't sashay anymore. She came over to me and kissed me again. Things began to escalate quickly. I don't know if it was because I was missing Angela or because I was somewhat buzzed from all the scotch. 
We fell back onto the couch and continued kissing. She stopped a moment later. Wait, I need to go to the powder room for a moment. I don't have a powder room, but there's a shitter right over there. She smiled and went to the bathroom. I got up and straightened my shirt and went over to the record player, put on some classical romance. I then dimmed the lights and walked out to the couch. She came out of the bathroom and smiled. She looked over at the record player. You have a record player? I collect records. I just bought one today from a couple of Italian kids. They had this rendition of Unchained Melody that was to die for. You're welcome to put it on. She pulled a tiny record from her large purse and put it onto the record plate. She dropped the needle on top and then slowly walked over to me. We started to kiss once again. What in the hell? This is terrible. I'll admit, it's not the best rendition, but the street vendors I bought it from said it was a classic version done by the famous Anito Pavarotti. Three Italian street vendors. Were there three of them? One with shaggy hair, one of them kind of chubby, and the other with a buzz cut? Yeah. It's a scam. They're not really Italian, they're just a couple of bratty kids who are trying to make enough money to buy a PS4. Or whatever the fuck they're calling it. They're assholes. They tried to scam me once with an Italian meal. Oh. Well then, I'll turn it off. She put the classic romance music back on. Straight fucking music. Oh yeah, this was music to get down to. This is music for old James Keys to get his boner wet to. It's too bad. I really love that song. I was hoping we could have some real fun. Real fun? What, were we gonna get a clay wheel then get all Patrick Swayze and ghost up in here? Clay? No, that's old school. Food. Food? What? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Food can be very erotic. It's like that old country saying. Joe Schmo liked food to go. He was a farmer with an agenda, so he tied squirrels into a bow. Your sayings are fucking weird, and I'm pretty sure you're making them up. Oh, I've heard that one. <laughs> really? No. Well, I'll be right back. I'll show you a few things. She ran into the kitchen and came back with handfuls of food. I didn't even know my fridge had that much. We'll start with this. That's a half a rotisserie chicken. I just think we should start with something like strawberries or chocolate sauce. There's no need. Wait. Wait, what are you going to do with that? I'm gonna put it in your butt. A whole rotisserie chicken? It's just a half. Yeah, I don't know about that. That thing looks pretty greasy. Trust me, food can be very sensual. I learned all about sexual desires and the way food can impact them from a book my friend bought from Thailand called Sex 2, Get More of It Done. She walked up to me and put the chicken on the coffee table in front of me. First, this. Natalie took off her shirt and then mine. We laid on the floor with the food around us. She grabbed the ketchup and sprayed us both. Then mustard and then relish. Fucking hot dogs, bro. We rolled around in the condiments. And then the fun came. Chicken, brownies, linguine, hot sauce, and baking powder. The rest of our clothes were ripped off when we got down to business. I'd rather not think about what she did with the food, but let's just say that most, if not all, went into one of my orifices at one time or another. I can't lie. As weird as it was, it was very erotic. I was harder than a stone base on an indestructible castle. I could see how into it she was. Covered in raisins, vinegar, and wasabi peas. Natalie was panting heavily with her eyes closed, her chest heaving. I'm saying it's all very delicious. <sighs> yes, more, more. I, um, oh yeah. Oh, that's the stuff. Uh, oh, Jesus. Yes. Oh, more. 
fruit all over her inner thighs and buttocks. God damn, what was wrong with me? Couldn't stop. I'm ready. The pita bread. Put the pita bread inside of me. What? Put it inside of me. Hurry. I'm not, I'm not sure how to do that. Hurry. I'm almost there. It, but it's pita, pita bread. It's flimsy. <gasps> do it now, please. I guess I could fold it. Just do it. It was crazy that this quiet country girl was so kinky, but I liked it. It was like my favorite rapper once said, I like a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. And this girl was definitely a freak. Natalie lived on a farm, and all I could think about was what might happen at night with all the eggs and chicken lay or the milk the cows produce. I'll never look at food the same way again. Hurry! Now! Now! She rolled around in a hodgepodge of food and drink. She was about to climax, and she wanted that pita bread, and she wanted it bad. So... Put it right where the sun don't shine. Yes. Oh, yeah, you know James Keys done did that. Yes. All right, well, yes. where are we going, guys? Yes. Where? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, just really. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Yes. continued throughout the night. By the time we finished, it was midnight and my living room looked like a fifth grade cafeteria. We ended up showering and then heading to bed. She slept in my arms until the phone awoke me at 8 a.m. sharp. Oh, God. Keys. Hello, Jim? Uh, Angela, Angela, Angela. Good. I'm good. I, I haven't heard from you in a while. I know. I'm sorry about that. But that's why I'm calling. It happens to be my birthday today. I'm heading out to dinner with some friends around six, and I was wondering if you'd care to join. Why didn't you tell me it was your birthday sooner? Well, because I didn't want you getting me anything. I don't really need any presents. Well, you did buy me a present. I was referencing the gun-shaped lighter she bought me when I helped her discover who her husband was cheating with. That was different. That was a thank you. Anyways, we're going to be at the Hunter's Cafe, and then we'll probably go downtown for some drinks. Of course I'll be there. Angela and I talked for a bit more, but I tried to keep my voice down since Natalie was still sleeping. After I hung up, I quickly got dressed. Angela didn't want me to buy her a gift, but I had to get her something. I rushed out of my apartment and closed my front door gently as to not wake up the kinky food bitch. It was still early, and I had plenty of time to find a gift, but I wanted to find something special. So I ran down Doppel Avenue, looking in each star window. Nothing caught my eye until I hit a small jewelry store. A pair of earrings sat in a gold cabinet. The earrings were in the shape of a small plane with a diamond heart in the center. Perfect. It was only a few days ago that we were reminiscing about our romantic times, sitting outside of the airport watching the planes take off. And, while the earrings were a bit gaudy, I felt the sentimental value was through the roof. Women love that kind of shit. I ran inside. Hey, can I help you? Yes, those gold earrings in the window? I'll take them. Uh, um, what gold earrings? Those ones. The, the planes? Yep. Oh man, those aren't gold, they're silver. No, the plain ones are gold. No, no, it's just this crappy lighting, man. The clerk reached up and blocked out the lighting above. The gold case and the gold plain earrings lost their color. The gold tint was gone. I mean, is it okay that they are silver? Or, I mean, were you looking for something specifically gold? The lighting. Gold. Gold. Sir? 
gold. And that's when something sparked in my head. I saw a flash of the O'Reilly case. I thought about the interviews, the files. Green bombs my ass, I'd figured it out. Gold coin. I quickly ran out of the store, leaving the store clerk bewildered. I ran all the way back to my apartment and I burst into the living room. Natalie was awake and putting on her pumps. There he is. Thank you for leaving me. I'm sorry, Natalie. I have a question, and I need you to be completely honest. Is the East Wing haunted with wisps? I've never seen any cooking utensils. Not whisks. Wisps. What are wisps? You know, they're like, they're like Peter Falk. Oh. No, not that I know of. So you're not afraid of entering the East Wing? No. What about your family? No, they're often in the East Wing. Jim, you're scaring me. What's this all about? I know who killed your father. And it wasn't Evan Greenbaum. Ah, hair, my honey. I thought it was old Evan Greenbaum. Who did commit this murder? Was it Desmond Grant? Or Angela Diamond? What about that Terrence O'Reilly fella? Or even Peter Falk? That's it. Those sad eyes. I've got this one cracked. That old James Keyes doesn't know murder from a hole in the ground. I'm off to the police station to collect my reward. But stay tuned next week, I guess, to hear James Keyes sobbing silently to himself. On the next Doppel Avenue Hurt. Doppel Avenue Hurt. Written by Robert M. Lamb. Edited by Jonathan Moss. Starring voices by Kyle Appleyard, Anita LaRose, Amy Laurie, Jose Carabello, Dan Johnson, Jonathan Moss, Adam Jetmore, Amber Simpson, and Shannon McCarthy. With additional voices by Robert M. Lamb, John Lazaveth, Nick Engelhart, Justin Stewart, Mike Lenhart, Heather Lenhart, Jesse Levine, Nicole Green, Shannon Lee, Morgan Buck, April Cadmus, Chris Davis, Ricky Lehner, Hope Ennis, and Michelle Birmingham. Visit www.sharkdropper.com to hear our other podcasts. Horror Play, the search for the scariest game ever made. Word of the Bay, a Tampa Bay Bay sports podcast. And the Shark Dropper podcast, where we talk random stuff with a mixture of improv. Also, we have an upcoming Academy Awards podcast titled Snubbed, where we rate each year's best picture nominees. <laughs>